Good morning, everybody. It is uh, 7.47 a.m. on August 21st, Monday, August 21st. So happy Monday, Rich, here on the Dev Talk Show. Happy Monday, Chris. Good to see you. Yeah, good seeing you. Um, so uh, we just had Philly.net last week. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny, the days all rolled together, but I'm pretty sure that it was last Wednesday now. <laughs> it was, yes. So... Uh, there's some interesting updates there, I think. So we'll take a quick look at those and let's see if I can get that. Oh, look, it's already popped it up on the screen. That's cool. Um, and we had last Wednesday a full stack hands-on lab that used .NET 7s and ASP.NET Core's minimal APIs and Angular and Bill Wolf for a couple of hours, went through building uh, a site, a very simple uh, site to examine uh, NFL rosters, and then even uh, some other stats too, like other leagues were thrown in. And that was using these two technologies. And we actually had, uh, we had a good turnout. A lot of people brought their laptops and I definitely saw some folks were able, they were following along and building the site along with Bill. And at the same time, that is up on YouTube um at the philly.net youtube channel which is at youtube.com slash philly.net so d-o-t-n-e-t -E yes that's right philly <laughs> d-o-t-n-e-t -E uh you can find that in fact if i go to the site let's see so and then nowadays youtube has everybody with the username preceded with an at sign so you can <laughs> the link which i'll try to zoom in on here is uh is at philly d-o-t-n-e-t -E although i think if you leave the at sign out i think it still works because that was the channel name originally mm -hmm. um and so anyways at the very top at the very top we have the monthly meetings playlist and the first one in the playlist right now is full stack hands-on lab with dotnet core minimal seven minimal apis uh, and you can see that some of the other shows in the past that have uh that have been posted. We still have some in the backlog. That's mostly just, um, well, frankly, it's my getting time to to take just a little bit of time and get them up on YouTube. <laughs> so, so anyways, yeah, I think that's definitely worth checking out. And the other thing that's nice about this one is that you will see there is a, a companion page on GitHub. Um, the link for that is, is here as well, bit.ly slash PDN for philly.net and then the date, uh, 2308.16. And when you click here, you get a readme with a little bit of an overview and requirements for what you would need to follow along. And then you can follow along with all of the code and all of the instructions. And so what's really nice is you can watch the video and then try doing this, or you can pause the video as you're going along. And this is also how many folks uh, followed along is they were able to cut and paste code instead of trying to, you know, type in a bunch of stuff very quickly. And then there's some blog posts at the end that talk about minimal APIs um, just from different different authors, uh, some YouTube videos, some blog posts. So a lot of good resources here. Yeah, yeah, it was a really good session. Um, I think what, one of the more popular or populated ones that we've had recently. So it was kind of nice yeah. to see that many people together. Yeah, yeah. Philly.net is back in person now for about a year. And um, I agree with you. I think it was really nice to, to see all that. So today, and we're going to see if we can work through this because uh, this, is, this is definitely a no rehearsal show. <laughs> um, and I think for a couple reasons, one of them is, is that it would be kind of difficult to rehearse uh, doing this because once you've done it, you'd kind of have to wait for your certificates to expire again. <laughs> so, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you don't have to, I suppose you could maybe Go renew one domain. Yeah, you could renew one domain and then not the other or something like that. So I'm just checking that we've got everything set up here for this and and then I'm going to so, want to switch. Over. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, this is this is really good because um, there were a couple of people who were at Philly.net. And I think that's where I, I got this, where, you know, 
they heard we were going to be doing the renewing of the certificates and oh, yeah. like, was kind of, you know, we had the last minute cancel the show um, on, I think it was Tuesday. Um, right. But it was, it was one of those things where they really wanted to see it. So yeah, uh, it's great. Well, I hope we do too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll see. So yeah. I mean, we'll see what we can do in an hour. So yeah. So let's talk about the dev talk show. Here I am in, this happens to be Microsoft edge. And if I try to go to the dev talk show.com, um, edge crosses out the HTTPS and reminds me that it's not secure. And then when you click in a little bit, uh, the reason turns out to be that that's not what I was looking for, but you can actually see the certificate. I know it's possible. Um, it might be this, I think it's this little certificate icon right here that says show certificate. So I'm looking at that in the upper left-hand corner. There's just this little, it's out of the way. You might not know it's there if you've never seen it before. And so if I click at first, I had to click on not secure and then click on your connection is secure. And then I can click on this little certificate. And the problem here is not the uh, common name, even though it doesn't match in this particular example, because um, it's actually set up to properly manage four uh, entries, www for both for the dev talk show and dev talk show. Mm -hmm. um, it's that Are it's you expired. Are you able to zoom in on that? At yeah, all? yeah. Sorry. Yep, that got really, that got really small. Well, and hopefully that helps a little bit that we can see that it expired on July 18th. And so, of course, our web browsers are doing a great job of saying, you probably shouldn't, shouldn't go here. Uh, that's even when it gives the more concrete error certificate date invalid. I believe you can try to say continue. The server could not prove that it is a devtalkshow.com. Good. Uh, I'm not. Oh, okay. That worked. I, I know in another time we even had a talk about how this wasn't working to click through. And I, I went to Chrome and I'm not sure what's different, but we, we, we want to fix that. Yes. So not a good user experience. No, no. <laughs> and, and you really shouldn't click through the way I did. So we should fix that. Um, <clears throat> we use let's encrypt for this which is a non, what well, it says right there, nonprofit certificate authority providing TLS certificates, 300 million websites. Uh, this doesn't cost you anything. Um, and there's some documentation talking about how to onboard. And the reason I brought up this particular page is not because we're not gonna work the documentation, but uh, it explains their method of DNS validation where essentially you're proving that you control the site um, by setting a DNS entry that that you've, in a way, Let's Encrypt knows, well, we've agreed that this is what you're going to set, and then you set it, so therefore it must be your site. Right. Mm -hmm. So Acme is what I'm interested in here. So um, yeah, Acme is the, the technique, and... The, uh, the trick here is, and I, I need to go to the code real quick for this, which I'll bring up in another screen. But yeah, did you have a comment on, on no, Acme I was, and Let's Encrypt you? I, okay. <laughs> when no, you I said Acme, it, it kind of took me by surprise that I'm trying to just, you know, back, recall what Acme is, that's all. Um, well, it looks like the process. Yes. Uh, so if I go back, I think what we find, uh, and, and I, I want to make clear that I'm, not 100% sure if Acme is a st standard that maybe um, Let's Encrypt created or is just implemented, for example, and maybe they just implemented it because, and here's why I would guess that, because right here in their client developer implementation, they say differences from the Acme RFC. So now there it looks like there is an Acme specification um, that, and again, learning all this kind of on the fly, and mm -hmm. it looks like this came out in 2019, automatic certificate management environment. And it was a method, uh, which came first, you know, I'm not sure because here we're saying 2019 and Let's Encrypt is celebrating. Well, I don't know for sure if it's celebrating 10 years uh, specifically. Uh, part of me thinks maybe because I think this site went up in 2019, um, our site. So it could be that let's make this a standard. And, and that makes yeah. sense. And this, this just describes a protocol for doing exactly what we talked about. 
Yeah, but the reason that it's important is because, um, first of all, you have to, in, in ASP.NET Core, your code does need uh, to give a little help to Acme here. Right. And it does it, um, let's see, I just need to find the repo so that we can look at this. And I think this is it here. So I will bring this over because we are not looking at it. This happens to be the repository where the Dev Talk Show website is stored. Mm -hmm. And we see that it, it's using ASP.NET MVC. And I'm having a controller models and views folder. But there's also a Let's Encrypt folder. And so I know folks who maybe are listening to this can't see, so we're not going to dwell on the code. But this Acme Challenge Responder Extensions actually came from this page here. Uh, this is this. There's a GitHub repo here. The the username is is it could be Marco S Kirshner, uh, could be Marcos Kirshner. Um, I don't know the uh, the owner, uh, and it's a repo called Acme Challenge Responder, which specifically talks about um, it, it basically implements this uh, this Acme Challenge extension. And what I did is I. I, I kind of just pulled it out of here. Okay. So I know that I started with this, but you, when you mm -hmm. look at this yourself, you might say like, well, wait a second. I don't, I don't see what you're talking about. But if I recall correctly, I believe I looked in here and said, okay, let me, let me pull out what I need. And, and this code has been modified about two years ago. So it actually may be improved or changed. And I, I, I haven't reviewed it, but I have reviewed, you know, we can look at our version, which was, um it really it really just provides a couple it provides a, an extension method that you put into the asp.net pipeline and the idea uh is that it responds to a, a, some web requests with um just the the response that the acme algorithm needs okay so and it might the, make yeah go ahead although that other project you know it looked like a console app or what have yeah. you that had a number of different classes and stuff in it you basically streamlined it just into that one class for our useful needs. Yeah, yeah. We only needed one thing. If if I go to their startup, it might be a little bit more obvious. Is there was a, let's see this method gets called by the runtime. Maybe it was in program because it's the Acme Challenge Responder project. Now I looked at this a while ago, so I wonder how much of much it has changed. Uh -huh. So maybe it's confusing to look at it because I, I think even now thinking about it, I'm looking at it and saying, um, it looks like it's definitely changed. But in this case, I just needed this extension method, which really doesn't do a whole lot more than use. It does use the local file system, uh, mm -hmm. which is even okay in Azure web apps, um, right. because you're just doing this process like right now if your server comes down and comes up later, that's fine. You've accomplished your goal, which is installing the cert. And uh, it knows how to, it knows how to deal with this. So um, that might be interesting to go figure out or remember how this works. <laughs> but let's see, what else do we need as a piece of this puzzle is there is a PowerShell script that I have Mm -hmm. and let me find that and try now, that powershell script come from the same project no it didn't it didn't let me see if we can figure out where that was from there was a azure let's encrypt renewer github project okay and uh so i've i've clicked over to that and again I did this a few years ago um, and the Let's Encrypt Web App Renewer was designed, uh, it was designed to be this complete end-to-end -end web job, you know, Azure web jobs. And, yeah, the, uh, old, the precursor to functions. Sure, sure. It's definitely older. It was a way to execute some code in your Azure web app. And it was great for things like background processes or things that ran on a timer, um, very much like 
Azure functions, but but a little bit more raw. You had a lot more. You were involved a lot more in the deployment than you would be in an Azure function. Yeah. Um, and so once again, there was a little bit of cutting and pasting out of here because there is PowerShell in here somewhere, unless he's changed it, unless it's been changed. And this thing like knows how to uh, use the command line and everything. So um, it's interesting, though, when you go to the front page and it says you probably don't need this because Microsoft mm -hmm. has a free managed certificate service, which maybe we can look at another time. Um, yeah, even kind of saying you probably don't need it for Azure anymore because you could just use what's in the box. That's that's interesting. I think I maybe kind of sort of knew that, but but clearly did not remember it. So um, let's look at that. OK, so I have this folder, which I can't. I don't know of a way to make. Can I make this view larger? I guess I kind of can. I could say large icons, which maybe is a little bit better, but I'll also zoom in. So there's yeah. a lot going on in here. You see a bunch of DLLs, and mainly because it's an application that's going to be run by the PowerShell. Mm -hmm. um, at least I was pretty sure it was PowerShell. Maybe I'm wrong about that, and we need to write PowerShell. Because there's the Azure Let's Encrypt Renewer. And actually, no, that's an XE. There it is right there. So I suppose what we would need is to write some PowerShell that uh, that just runs this. I just want to run this process every 90 days. And there's a specific command line that I need to use. Um, there are some secrets with it, though. So I'm trying to be careful because I want to make sure when I bring up the portal that those are masked. Yeah. So, so I'm going to do that real quick, but go ahead while I'm looking. Question, so question, if that's, if that's an executable uh -huh. and I mean, do you have the code for that executable or is it, or is it like, is it like a compiled one where you just, you took the XE and that's it? I took the XE. It, it may be that if I come back to the let's encrypt web app renewer, we could rebuild this again. Um, but okay. I'm, my concern here is that being older. I kind of yeah. wonder how much has changed. Yep. So I wonder how much we'd have to look at. It's like if somebody wanted to accomplish this today, have I, do I have a version to the point where it's pretty much, you know, uh, it's pretty much doesn't exist. Like it's a total one off at this point. Right. I suppose yeah. that's definitely possible. Yeah. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, if the PowerShell is just calling the executable, how much do we need of the PowerShell? Uh, right. Well, can we just basically take all the executable bits and make that inside and have that run inside of your function? Or at the very least, have the function call the executable, right? Because there's no reason that yeah. uh, PowerShell well, exactly. needs to get involved. Right. It's really just the idea that could I run this process on a timer mm -hmm. and do it maybe like every 85 days or something? Um, you know, what does happen is I do get emails that remind me that it's expiring. And I think, mm -hmm. uh, and then what happens is I either forget or, or who knows why I don't do it. I think in this case, I've been slow on it because I was hoping that, that we would work on doing this live, but, um, yeah. let's see if I can find, okay, cool. And I just want to double check that this is all going to be masked. Okay. I think it is. And then the one more thing I want to check is in the secret section. Okay, the secret section does seem masked. So that's good. Okay. Cool. So one of the things that you need in order to use uh, in order to use this is you need an app registration. And it'll be interesting because like the author is talking about how the author of both these sites are saying, look, you don't need this anymore. You can use the managed service. So um, but it might be interesting if you're still looking at Let's Encrypt. So I have the portal open to my particular app registrations. And the, the key one here is the Dev Talk Show Let's Encrypt. And so mm -hmm. app registrations and enterprise applications, uh, I find that I have to look up again and again the, the subtle differences and if there's a reason you would choose one or the other, and at the same time, I think one 
is kind of above the other in terms of, um, for instance, we were just, if you were watching on the screen, we were just looking at app registrations and you could see this one called the Dev Talk Show Let's Encrypt. But then if I go click on enterprise applications, we see it again. And, and I think it's because if I'm right, that all app, app registration, all application registrations are enterprise applications, I think. Um, I don't know if you know. I'm trying to refresh my memory, yeah. to be honest. Yeah, <laughs> and it's the kind of thing that I have to kind of look up every time. Yeah. So um, here in, in enterprise apps, this isn't really something that I need. Uh, there's an app ID, there's an object ID. What I needed was an app registration because under app registrations, and I'm pretty sure that I made sure this wasn't going to show what was important, but I'm going to double check again. Um, yeah, I think we're okay. I think we're okay. Is in app registrations, there is a client secret section. And so a client secret was created and you can see that the the value is masked. Oh, and look at that. It even expires next year. So it looks like I would have to, uh, it looks like I would have to, to recreate the secret, which is no big deal. Now, this client secret allows me to write an application that without using any kind of token exchange or anything like that, uh, or any, or, or a different method to basically say, Hey, I'm authorized to act as this app registration. So, I think in some sense, this app registration is, I, I don't think it's fair to call it like a user account, but I think no. it is a service principle. Yes. Yeah. Ultimately that if you were to do this via, um, if you were to do that via power, uh, not PowerShell, the command line interface, right? It's, you're, it's like an AZ AD SP or service principle add is what you're doing there. The difference is that, um, yeah, that's uh, usually for an app registration like this, there's some kind of a URL that you refer back to to register so that the handshaking can happen, right? But it's not needed. So yeah, and you're absolutely right. It is a service principle in your AD account that gets created. Yeah, and so, you know, there are a lot of these concepts. I'm I'm not, I feel like there are things that I, I constantly have to uh, sort of relearn each time. And it's these the subtle the subtle things about uh, service principles managed identities, yeah. Um, yeah. Which I which I think, if I recall correctly, a managed identity is a service principle. Yep. It's just one that you don't you don't work on the password. You don't work on changing them. You don't work on it. What you would have to do when you were when whenever when if you were on prem and you and maybe your organization had the concept of service accounts, which was we're going to have an account that we want you to use to talk to SQL. Uh, here's the username and password. And then, oh, if we change it, every dependent application has to change too. Right. Yeah. And I um, feel like that was a pretty common pattern. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then the managed identity bit is just in, in Azure, you can have services like an app service be its own identity so that it has permissions to do uh, to access certain things in the rest of your architecture. So maybe accessing your key vault, or as you said, maybe accessing your data. So, um, but then you can create your own user-defined managed identities as well. So there's a, not only services, but you know, you can be user-defined too. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really helpful because, you know, um, I don't remember which services support everything here, but, but in the case of you want one of your Azure resources, to have access to have to another Azure resource, whether that access is read, write, however granular you need it to be, is that now you're completely out of the management ball game. You just basically say, oh yeah, um, just that that resource of mine has access to this. And and that is what you just put that system managed, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And, yeah. and then user managed, if I say now I'm writing an application and I want to act as some identity. So I need a user managed one. And then I need some way to tell, frankly, Azure AD, I need some way to tell it uh, I'm that identity right now. And that's really all that's happening here with this client. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Um, other things that you need to identify yourself are, 
who you are, you know, what's your client, what's your tenant. I'm not 100% sure that that this is considered sensitive, although I feel like the secret's the, the important one. I think that there are a lot of folks who might not reveal these just to keep you one more one more heartbeat away, you know, right. <laughs> from the thing you really need. But in some sense, uh, this is saying who I am and, and, and where I'm from, and that's not going to change uh, right. at all. So... Um, in any case, what I want to show is the command line that you need to renew using uh, this process. Now, the command line has the secrets on it, so I've rewritten it. Okay. We will look at this here in um, we'll look at this here in PowerShell, uh, just at the command line. And <clears throat> so, this Azure Let's Encrypt Renewer takes several uh, parameters. And so, what you see here is you you'll see a parade of GUIDs essentially okay. the first being your subscription ID. So that's the dash S because it needs to yeah. know the subscription. That kind of makes sense. And then the dash R is the resource group that your resource is in. And in our case, the resource group name is the dev talk show production. So now we have everything we need to drill into the resource group. We know the sub, the subscription ID, and we know the resource group. Next up is your application. Your web app probably has a name and the resource name here is TDTS prod. So this would just be like if I was in the portal and I'm clicking around and I say, okay, let me see all of the web apps in this resource group. That would be it. Mm -hmm. And then they, the dash O is what hosts are you registering? What are you asking for a certificate for that you want to let's encrypt to, uh, to, uh, to create for you? So I have two command lines that I do this with. And um, because I run it once for www.devtalkshow.com and I run it again for just devtalkshow.com. Okay. I'm not able to, at least I'm pretty sure there's a reason, there must be a reason that I have two in my little readme file here that I run every 90 days uh, is I believe because uh devtalkshow.com and the devtalkshow.com as far as dns is concerned are totally different domains they might as well be jack and jill.com right and then humpty dumpty.com as far as dns is concerned i can only have a certificate created for either the root and some second and third levels or technically i guess third and fourth levels uh and beyond or I can, or I can basically what I'm doing here is I'm specifying two within the same, you know, TLD, the top level domain. If you try to mix and match like www here, go ahead and do www.devtalkshow.com and www.thedevtalkshow.com. Uh, the TLS certificate process itself is going to say, hold on, you can't have a certificate for both of those in one. You just can't. Right. So that that's sense. why, yeah. So I have two command lines that I run. It takes me like less than five minutes. Um, except that I do it manually. That's the whole point. The dash E is Chris Gomez at outlook.com, which is what you're doing is, is, is because this let's encrypt renewer talks to let's encrypt is it tells let's encrypt. Here's who you notify for your reminders. And that just happens to be my email address. So now everybody knows where to spam me, I suppose. Um, <laughs> I didn't change that. Uh, then the secrets here, the things that you generally would not share is you saw the client ID earlier. You saw the tenant ID earlier. Tenant ID is your, that's above subscriptions, right? It's your, uh, you can have many subscriptions in a tenant. Yeah. Um, but your tenant, there's one, it has one Azure AD is a tenant. Maybe I'm wrong uh, about that. No, you're absolutely right. So typically okay. the tenant and your Azure AD are the same. Yeah, right. And I'm in that, that when you saw me playing around in Azure AD earlier, it's going to be this tenant, the client ID we got from the app registration. So when you're wondering like, well, what is that? The client, uh, a lot of times Azure calls that the application ID. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually believe some of the history of this is, is, is that it was being called the application ID in Azure before uh, the OAuth world sort of made client ID the, the fashionable name, I believe. And so that's why a lot of times in Azure, you see parentheses like application and then slash uh, parentheses client ID. So if you're ever running around 
the Azure portal or whatever, and you just say like, I, this thing wants a client ID. I don't know what it is. Then, right. then look for the app ID as well. Um, and then the big one was the client secret, which we saw masked. Mm -hmm. And so I certainly am not going to share that. <laughs> so, uh, I actually am also a little concerned about running it. Um, cause I didn't try this beforehand running it live because I don't know what will be regurgitated, oh. including that client secret. Right. Yeah. I suppose I could theoretically dump the client secret after this. I mean, I think that would be okay. I'm trying to decide. Uh, <laughs> I, I would say run it off screen. Yeah. And then let's see what we can bring back. <laughs> right. Exactly. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the set for. Uh, we just saw. We just saw without. The uh, the the I mean, it is the dev talk show. Mm -hmm. But. Um, I kind of felt like, oh, I have to actually switch to the folder. Like, how silly of me. I have to switch to the folder that the Azure renewer is in. What about that? And and you can see that because I knew I would forget about this stuff, the sharp-eyed people may have noticed that, like, I put this in my OneDrive. Okay. And that way, no matter where I am, <laughs> uh, I can find this thing and, and say, okay, um, let's renew. Let's see, Azure... Azure automation and oh, I've got more to do here. Okay. What crap? And then the uh, newer build. And this is the folder that I should get into here. So I wasn't in the correct folder because I was in my C drive source. Uh. So you can see that this is a pain. This, this little, <laughs> I, it's not again, I, as much as easy as I've made it for myself. I feel right. like every time I sort of have to remember how so to do this. Just so you know, the screen we see here is blank because we moved that yes. window out of there. Okay. Right. Gotcha. And and that was on purpose because I'm yeah. I'm about to run this. Okay. And so yes, people who are watching right now who are like, why aren't you seeing anything? Because this command line does have a valuable client secret on it. Yeah. And while that's thinking, what I'm gonna do is See if we can head back to the portal and go to the. Uh, oh, that's interesting. I think I might have needed to put some things in parentheses, or maybe try this from command prompt. And because I believe that I used to do this from command prompt. Silly me. Um, oh. And so what's happening is I think PowerShell is just saying like, hey, you need to, I don't think it's bad. I think it's just saying you need to uh, put some parentheses around some of your uh, parameters that maybe I didn't have to. In. Okay. So I'm going to try that and see what happens. It, when it when it failed for me, it didn't fail saying, sorry, you're using uh, Let's Encrypt wrong. It wasn't that. Mm -hmm. It was just, oh. Um, you can't do this because I didn't read some of the parameters correctly. So now I'm going to give this a second try from the command prompt window. I, I could, I could definitely fix this for PowerShell, but as long as this starts running, which it is, it's on its way. And it certainly did spit out some of the things that I wouldn't have wanted. So that's good. Uh, let's go find the resource group and we will go to in the resource group, we have TDTS prod, just like I said, that's the, that was the name of the app service. Yeah. And further down, we have certificates. So, so in the portal on the left-hand side, there's a certificates little uh, applet section. Um, and when you click on that, I it's not managed certificates. And so it's fair to say that that maybe we should give this a try in a, in a future show instead of what I did, bring your own certificates, which is just how... I'd been using this, you know, three or four years ago. You can see they're all expired. Mm -hmm. And so what's happening now as I'm looking over on the right is it's in the middle of the challenge response process where um, the Let's Encrypt service basically said, hey, I need, you know, if you want to prove that you own this domain, go put something in your DNS entry. And then uh, and then basically you, you hand that to it. And that some of that code knows how to take that challenge, how to do it 
what you're it's asking you to do so that you can prove to it that it owns it. And so now that's finished over on this side. Um, okay. I'm I'm pretty comfortable looking at at this. There wasn't anything on here, but I'm not going to scroll back too far. But it just like throws a wall of stuff at you. Yeah. And and it this it didn't take very long. Just the time that we were talking. So now, if I hit refresh here, let's see. Here we are at the bottom, at the very bottom of my stack. It's got no action needed. It's, it says expiring in November. We have www.devtalkshow.com and devtalkshow.com. So going so back. 60 yeah. days worth of protection. Yeah, I guess so. Is that 60, 90, 8, 9, 10, 11? Oh, I'm sorry, um, maybe 90. Yeah. Three yeah. months. Yep. And and it's 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 pretty neat. I, I it's even possible for me to bring the cert down, but I'm not gonna have to do that. I don't have to do that. I think it's pretty sure it's possible. Because now if I just go to my browser and I go to devtalkshow.com, because I did register both. I figured a lot of people might watch the show and they say, like, oh, what was that show called? It was called Dev Talk Show. Is <clears throat> Edge is happy and Chrome and Firefox and Safari, everybody will be too. That lock is is there. I didn't get a warning, um, and if I go click on the lock, it does say connection is secure. And uh, if I click on that, we can click on that little certificate button again. And what we now see is issued just a few minutes ago yeah. um, and expires Sunday, November 19th. So that's what I did, but that doesn't, you know, again, I had to do this all the time. I have to do this every right. so often. So I think what we can probably figure out, um, it probably makes sense to maybe reconstruct some of the how to, because even it, it's, it's unfortunate that I'm not even sure that I could point somebody to, uh, to oh, here, this GitHub repo is all you need. There are some projects out there though. There was a web app renewer project. Um, in fact, I don't remember if this was it, where you deploy it as a web app another web app and it does it for you and it does it using web jobs. And so that's a little mm. pre Azure functions as well. But for the purposes of this, what I'm looking at is uh, like, how would I go about using some repeat process to do this for me every so often? I, I didn't know if that was a logic app, maybe, uh, maybe or a function, I wasn't sure the best way to go about it. Um, I mean, so both functions and logic apps give you the capability to do, have tasks that cause them to, to run on a recurring basis. Okay. Um, so I guess the question is, it, it certainly could be a logic app, but that logic app would have to call something that runs the code that we're seeing here, which would typically be inside of, um, or could be inside of a function itself. Um, so I guess, I guess in walking, cause you can't write a logic app has the capability to, it's a logic app for those who don't know, essentially is a flow or a workflow, sorry. Um, it you know you have steps you have the ability to, to branch and have conditions so there's some you know some complexity you can get into there and it's it's part of you know when you think of integrating data and services um, from various sources so one of the cool things about the logic app is that it's got like hundreds of connectors certainly to things in the microsoft universe but also in many of our third party and partner and and other vendors out there into their spaces as well so um you know you can pretty much connect to anything that's out there with anything with any other service and the cool thing is that if it's not there you can always write your own and yeah. have a custom connector right so you've right. got the flexibility to connect anything to anything else um but it's there's no place really in here for me to say, I want to write code or I want to script right. out kind of what we just did. And that's where functions come into play. Cause you can certainly call a logic or a function from a logic app. It's with the connection there is very easy. 
Yeah, and you can see the other issue I have. So we did a show with Kevin Griffin on Logic Apps. Yeah, yeah, it might be a couple years old now, but certainly at our our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash the dev talk show. Uh, that was great too. Kevin was very yeah. thorough. He really understood it. And it was uh, just from top to bottom, a lot of use cases. Um, one of the challenges I have here, as you can see, is that I'm running an app from a folder that's got a bunch of assemblies. Mm. So an interesting challenge might be you have to get this somewhere. Yeah. Um, so that might be a storage account, I suppose. Uh, although I'm not sure. I mean, I mean, if you go down the function path, yeah, there is a, um, there's essentially a, a, a folder hierarchy that exists for your function app, and you can have those assemblies be part of that. Because what's going to happen is that folder structure with all of the things that the function needs to run is going to get deployed into a storage account and then this way because because you can have multiple instances of a function up and running if you need an instance of that it's going to take those files bring them to that virtual machine where the function runs and have it essentially you know unpack and deploy those so there's no there's no problem with adding assemblies or dlls into your functions project okay because what i'm wondering is <clears throat> Like you said, Azure Functions itself requires a storage account still, I think. Yes. Um, I know that it did. And the only reason why I hesitated there is I haven't gotten to really explore the isolated functions model, which is, uh, I think, the I think pref the preferred way forward. Yeah. And so I just wasn't 100% sure like how much has changed. I, I can't wait to look at that model. I think, as you know, Rich, as I've done some Azure Functions stuff at philly.net, and I have not yet myself personally, more than just on the surface level, gotten mm -hmm. to examine isolated the isolated model. I've I've done the file new project and looked through it and ran it, but that's a different thing from like, okay, I used it and now I want to do a talk on it. <laughs> right. Yeah. A little bit different so, there. Yeah. So I'd like to because I think I think it's really interesting in terms of folks who maybe have used Azure functions before, you might be a little frustrated with the fact that it it, it, you deploy it in a function app. And so not that, that that's bad. It just means that um, the isolated model is one step closer to kind of freeing you, the code being a, just a little bit more portable. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you couldn't be portable before. You could maybe take your core business logic and put it into a NuGet package, and now it's shareable among a console app and an Azure function and whatever. But even the kickoff code is, is kind of special and so I yeah. think one of the selling points of isolated is it's even more generic in a way, more genericized. So that'll yeah. be yeah. There's yeah. Th there's less tight integration with your with the functions components when you run isolated versus yeah. not. Um, and there are some people out there who um, talk about using the the command pattern okay. and being able to you know all of your code that you're you're. The code that we've gotten in executable, let's say, right? All of that is going to be um, in your uh, li live essentially in something that gets called from the function via a command, and then that code is just going to run. So that doesn't really understand that it's running inside of a function. It just knows something called me, and I've got to I've got to do my work. Okay. Yeah. Um. So. There will definitely have to be a storage account in here yeah. and probably either another app service or maybe as part of this app service, a function app, which could all be created in the portal. It could. Um, the downside with creating stuff directly, um, I mean, if we're, if we're going to go down this path, my, my recommendation is to, or how I would typically do this is firing up VS code and getting the function tools, getting the uh, function extension okay. and right. doing everything inside of visual studio code. Cause then this way we can essentially right from there, you know, do the, the right click package it up and push it to Azure. Okay. Yeah, sure. And so 
you know, that would probably get us into installing uh, the functions runtime, right? Exactly. It's yeah, really uh, easy. Super easy, uh, yeah. especially with, uh, um, you know, some of the, the, the wing gets that are out there. So. So let's see, we're talking about the Azure functions. Uh, is it the CLI? Is what it's called? Um, oh, core tools. It is this not is it, right? Sorry, uh, core tools. Yep. Yep. So Azure functions, core tools, which I have. I do recall that I've talked about these at Philly.net before. And mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. It's it's really neat. And so uh, the command line for the Azure functions core tools. <clears throat> in fact, I actually just scrolled by the documentation. So here in the documentation, work with Azure functions core tools, you're going to learn all about the core tools, which you can use different programming languages. And the key is, is that you've got to have Azure CLI, but but they're just funk. That's that's the name mm -hmm. of the tool. That's, I think, probably why I thought of it as a CLI. And so if I come to my system and I make this a little bit bigger so we can all see and I say funk version, uh, it says I, I don't know what you're talking about. So that means I need to install this. And we were saying if I just wing get search funk, I wonder if I'll see it. Maybe that would be pretty cool. Um, and here it is. Azure function. There you support go. Tools, right. So when you install in Winget, clearly there was a longer ID name here that I'm not getting. But I think I can also just try this. Uh, so yeah, well, we'll, we'll find out. <laughs> The, well, the difference is, is okay. that if you use the ID, okay, then I don't have to put quotes around it, single quotes, because right. there's no spaces. Whereas if I use the name, totally works, but you got to put single quotes around it so that it finds that. Okay, because I was trying to decide if I should go try to find the name, or maybe maybe part of the problem is is that I I went with way too zoomed in, and if I zoom out a little bit and run this again, okay, yep, I got a complete ID now. Yeah. So let's go with that. And hopefully that uh, I'll zoom back in so we can see a little bit. And let's see, it's win get install. Let's see if I just remember how easy it is. Uh, ID Azure Functions Core Tools. Is it that simple? And that's without me looking at the help. Yeah. And I, you, I, you shouldn't even need the ID. It's just. Okay. You think that'll just, yeah, let's try it. I, I've used Winget many times. You know what happens is I come in here and say like, "Hold on a second, let me let me do a dash dash help." Right. It's almost like as these tools get um, better at helping you, then I remember less and less. <laughs> Where, you know, you go back far enough, and I could dance around command line all day long, make co x copy uh, with recursing subdirectories, and don't bother asking me for permission. And so what you're not seeing on screen. Um, because it's happening on the other screen and I can't, oh, I can move it over. I couldn't tell if I could move it over is Winget has gone ahead and started what looks to me like an MSI. I guess it doesn't really matter that it is. That's the whole, that's the great part about Winget is it doesn't matter. Yeah. Although you can tell that because of the, what the downloading line there, right? Right. Um, and the other thing is yours ran without um, the, no, the, you know, the installation acceptance prompt. The, mm -hmm. for admins because you're running as an admin that's what that little gold shield at the beginning that's of right the command line means that's what i have yeah and that's that's oh my posh doing that for me in powershell mm -hmm. so i've installed and i know you get it you get a cool ascii graphic the first time you run this maybe multiple times i don't remember so i just run funk oh wait a second do i, I do, maybe i have to reset i might have to open an either open another powershell prompt or because I'm pretty sure it adds it to the to the path. Let's try it again. No. Hmm. Yeah, I would close and reopen. Okay. Or yeah. Okay. Or I'm wondering if um. Well, I guess let's find out. Let's do that again. Let's reopen the whole thing. You're right. It needs to refresh the environment if it did add it to the path. And if it didn't, no, nope, it's doing something now. It's thinking. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that was cool. it. And, um, oh, you know what? I feel like there used to be like this uh, lightning bolt ASCII art, but that's okay. Yeah. So I Azure Functions Core Tools, yeah. It might also be when it runs. Oh, okay. Um, right. 
So the core tools let you run an Azure Functions runtime locally for development. And uh, then you can like open up VS Code or whatever editor you want to use and, and basically do all your testing and debugging right here as if you were on Azure. And it works fine. Uh, I've used this in Linux. Um, okay. I've used it. I've used it in Windows. I'm actually somewhat surprised I don't have it installed here, but it could be that it's installed on the laptop that I take around for presentations. And so it was kind of neat earlier this morning to realize like, oh, I don't have this installed so we can show how easy it is. Mm -hmm. um, now, in Visual Studio Code, I don't necessarily think I have the functions extensions. So what I'm going to do is get a Visual Studio Code instance over here. Mm -hmm. And I suppose like it's the kind of thing where it would tell me. Um, oh, OK. So I may have had it installed. It's just saying I needed a reload, which is interesting. Or, or you know what? It could have been another one of the bundler extensions, oh, yeah. um, like the Azure one. Mm -hmm. Might have might have done that, too, or one of the Azure developer ones. So yeah, I do have this extension, which is cool. And it automatically does things like fire up the core tools for you. Yes. Uh, so I think all I have to do is say, like, I need a folder for this. And obviously, I could do this from command line if I wanted to. There's there's, there's actually a lot of different ways to do this. Yeah. Um, actually, the one cool um, that I did not know, we saw it last week at, uh, at philo.net, was the dash R extension. So it reloads inside of your current instance of Visual Studio Code. If you do, like, a code space dot. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's right. That was new um, for me. So if we say uh, uh, cert renew, that's what I'll call the folder, and say, yeah, I want that folder. Now, I believe what I can do is, OK, so that's now the current folder in Visual Studio Code, is I think I can say Azure Functions and just say, like, I want to create a function. And it's going to say, select the folder. Sure, that's fine. And I've been thinking PowerShell. Well, that's what I've been thinking. But I mean, I if, you're just call, if you're just calling that, hmm, that's interesting. If you're just calling the executable, or you're bringing that code into, yeah, I mean, PowerShell should be fine. Okay, select a template for your function. I suppose that it's technically a timer trigger. Yeah. It's just a long timer. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just going to say, I mean, look, we may change all this stuff later, but just to see it, I'm going to say renew cert. Oh, and then the cron expression, mm -hmm. which is really the whole trick. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think, let's see, this one looks like it's running every five seconds. So, I don't know that I have to get this perfectly right, right this moment, but theoretically, I'm pretty sure that I would say do it like 85 days unless I, well, maybe I did that wrong. See, now I have to go remember how cron expressions work. So I'm not going to worry about getting this right as we're running out of time. Here. Oh, I don't like it at all. Let's do renew cert again, and we'll just go with this one and we'll figure out, we'll figure that out later. I've, I've certainly figured that out before. So I've never created a, a PowerShell function app before. Mm -hmm. So that'll be interesting. And I, I was really curious to see what comes out here. We get a run PowerShell one, just a script. Yep. Um, and then I guess we're going to get some, oh, yeah, we get some, a readme. Okay. Yep. And then your function JSON. Mm-hmm. That's where your schedule is. Right. Oh, I see what I did wrong there. Format of the second day of week. And so that was probably not what I wanted. And so I wonder if I could have said something like 85 here, change that to zero. And then I wonder what it's complaining about. Saying, oh, you don't match the pattern. Huh. OK. Well, um, oh, I see how interesting that uh you know so, you know a pro here would tell me 
how I should really write this expression because it's talking about, I think, which <clears throat> when the seconds is equal to zero minutes visible by five for any hour, day of the month, month. Is, and it's what I really want is like, I want it to be like every 90 days. And, I, and I'm sure I could figure that out or we could Google it. <laughs> You know, I, I think we can ask <laughs> chat somebody here. Yeah, that's true. Um, let's see. Let's see what chat says. So. Uh, OK, is it going to open the chat window? All right. How do I write a cron expression for a I didn't spell that correctly, but I bet you it'll figure it out. I want to run every. 85 days. So it's thinking. Oh, mm -hmm. here we go. Oh, <laughs> well, not quite. This expression will run the job at midnight on the first day of every 85th month. <laughs> that's, that's not quite it. Um, I wonder if if I'm barking up the wrong tree a little bit about how to set this up, but um, I mean, is it if it's days, right? Isn't it just zero zero eighty five? Well, I thought so. I didn't, I actually didn't even say that right. What if I want to run the expression every? I thought so, but then when you read this readme, and they say. In plain text, it means when seconds is equal to zero, minutes is divisible by five. So that I can understand how that would work. That would be every five minutes for any hour, day of the month, month, day of the week, or year. So it feels like the rest of the expression does not say per month, per, you know. Um, yeah. It's entirely possible that I'm I'm either pushing for more than I can actually do or, or likewise. But it is 8.45. Oh yeah, yeah. So that was sneaking up on both of us. Yeah, and, and and unfortunately, it is time for stand up. And so I think we both kind of knew that we may uh, work a little bit on figuring this out today. Um, it's the kind of thing where, yeah, well, we didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know what I didn't know, and we've got a lot of things to figure out. We've got to figure out the cron expressions, and then I gonna I will see if I can take some time to see if I can actually find source code that other people can use instead of my my version, which is clearly kind of a Franken version now that I yeah. even wonder if I could point someone at um, because it, I think it'd be nice for folks to, to work with that. But in any case, I know you got to run, Rich. So do I. Cool. Thanks, everybody, for joining us and bearing with us on part one here of figuring out how we can renew our certs on a schedule, at least using this was my idea. Maybe Maybe we'll decide to do something else, but it was an idea that I had and I wanted to see it work. Uh, as we head towards building the dot, the dev talk show website. So uh, for Rich, I'm Chris Gomez, and we will see you next time on the dev talk show.